thanks so much for coming. It's um, it's pretty exciting because I think um, most of us at some point prior to starting um, our respective organisations were pretty much sat where you guys are at the moment, interested in starting something up yourself, hatching plans, whatnot, uh, and listening to other founders who've, I guess, been there and done that or doing that at the moment. So I thought instead of uh, just having a panel session and talking at you the whole time, we would give you guys the opportunity to get up close and personal uh, with with all of us, basically, to run through some of those questions that are listed out in the program. So how do you get started with forming a startup or an organisation? And what are the main tips and traps to look out for? Should you go down the collaboration route? If you're in a law firm or an organisation, should, should you be doing that in-house as an entrepreneur? So tips and traps like that. Um, we'll break out into groups in order to do that, uh, come back together, report back a few findings, and then wrap up the end with a panel discussion and some Q&A, just to um, get any further thoughts uh, from the audience. Uh, so what we'll do is just do a quick, just two or three minutes from, from each of the founders. They can introduce themselves, get to know a bit about where they're from and what they're doing. So, um, Joe Al Kaya, did you want to kick us off, given that you're closest? Great, sorry, use the mic. Yes. Yep. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, that sounds like it works. Okay. Yeah, so thanks, David. My name is Joel Kayat. I'm a barrister, lawyer, and mediator. Practiced in the UK, practiced in, in Australia uh, for about 10 years. And the uh, premise behind Resolve Disputes Online was a few years ago we had the crazy idea of basically creating an online platform that allowed uh, mediators, arbitrators, and court systems to resolve disputes using technology as opposed to physically having to meet in, in court or physically having to meet in an, in an arbitration session or a mediation session. And uh, that uh, platform was built over a period of, uh, of a few years. And the technology now is being used by practitioners in Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, parts of Europe and also um, Asia. So we have the, the largest mediation centre in Asia that's currently using the technology which is fantastic, but the interesting uh, point has always been whenever you introduce new technologies, you have certain people who are willing to take a bit of a leap and then are pleasantly surprised about how more, how more efficient it can be. But then you also have you know, those who have done, you know, who have been at the bar or been a judge or been a mediator for many, many decades and say, you know, the way that I do it is the only way that, I, that I'm going to, to do it and I have no interest in technology. Um, so the whole premise behind Resolve Disputes Online is to increase access to justice, which I guess is probably a real passion point for, for most people here. Um, so I, I look forward to yeah, sharing more, more information uh, in, in due course, but um, hopefully that gives you a pretty high level summary as to some of the things that we're, we're doing. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Claudia King, I'm the CEO and founder of Autonio. We help lawyers automate their repetitive legal work. Um, so we've created an automation platform where lawyers can automate uh, the, the processes of interviewing clients, collecting data, creating advice, documents, um, correspondence and reports. So I've had many highs and lows in my journey as a, as a legal tech founder. Um, I didn't have a tech background. I first became interested in tech in 2007, which was my first year practicing law. And I joined Facebook and I discovered um, you know, quite, a, quite a big issue in the legal industry on Facebook. I joined a number of Facebook groups where small businesses would um, join together to discuss opportunities um, and support one another. And I noticed how many small business owners would ask legal questions in these groups. And the information that they would be given by people who weren't lawyers was often wrong. And I was quite shocked by this as a new lawyer. And upon some further investigation, I discovered that a lot of these people did actually want to get advice from their lawyers about the things they were asking about. But there were a number of reasons why they weren't, including um, you know, they couldn't get hold of their lawyer, their lawyer wasn't emailing them back, the cost was too much, um, they didn't like lawyers, all sorts of different 
uh, reasons why they, they would rather ask a random person on Facebook who wasn't a lawyer for advice than talk to a lawyer. So this put me on, um, I suppose, my, my mission to, you know, to, to create a world where, where legal help, quality legal help is available to everyone everywhere. And my first step in that journey was I launched back in 2011 New Zealand's first online legal service, Legal Beagle. And through that, I realised I needed some automation technology. And I looked around for some, and I couldn't find what I was looking for, so decided to uh, build it myself. And once I'd done that, and we were successfully using it in Legal Beagle, um, I had some other firms approach me about using it, and really, Autonio came from, from there. And then last year, I sold my law practice to focus on Autonio full time. So. Yeah, that's me. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name's Dominic Woolrich. I'm the CEO of LawPath. Uh, probably in the scheme of legal tech startups in, in Australia, LawPath might be one of the oldest ones. We're about four years old. Um, we started the business very, very similar to, to Claudia, which was we saw a lot of uh, clients out there, especially SMBs, not able to access legal services themselves. Um, either through um, complexity or, or price. Um, so we originally started the business to replace lawyers. And I think everybody in the room might not be happy with that, with that comment. Uh, but the really good news is we've discovered through the journey of the last four years that we'll never replace lawyers. But what we can do is change the way that they work quite substantially. Um, so a big part of Law Path is actually building tools that allow clients to do simple legal tasks themselves. Uh, one of our first investors was a company called LexisNexis, who I'm sure you're all very across, and uh, we partnered with them to automate a lot of their precedents, um, not for lawyers, but directly for clients. So simple legal documents such as non-disclosure agreements and employment agreements, often if a client can't afford a lawyer, uh, they can come to LawPath and they can complete it through our software themselves. Um, as you all know, law is not just about documents, um, and documents are, are never enough. And so we also created a legal marketplace. So we have about a thousand lawyers on the marketplace right now from all around Australia. And really what it's doing is bringing together quite a fragmented industry of, of small lawyers and bringing them online all in one spot where, lawyer, where clients can submit a brief and then compare lawyers. Uh, those lawyers will submit fixed price quotes back to the client. Uh, they're all reviewed, they're all rated. Uh, and just like marketplaces in other industries, we've created one inside legal. All right, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Dimitri Zimra, I'm the founder of Law Squared. Uh, Law Squared is about two and a half years old, so probably uh, just at the start of what we call some of the new law revolution. It certainly has been a big buzz, I think, uh, over the last two and a half years, certainly since um, we've been in this space. Uh, Law Squared is a law firm. Uh, we have offices in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane with a team of 18 working with entrepreneurs and high growth businesses largely. Uh, my background is I'm an insurance commercial uh, litigator um, and after six and a bit years working in very traditional mid-tier firms, I uh, was very quickly disenfranchised and uh, felt there was a better way for legal services to be delivered uh, and that was both from a, a lawyer perspective but also from a, a client perspective. And when I looked at the market at the time, there wasn't really anyone doing anything tremendously different. And what does different mean? It just means actually being really connected with a client and act you know, giving them a different service, which is not based around time. So similar to what was discussed earlier this morning around outcome-based um, you know, legal work, we really are a firm based on outcomes and our fees are solely based on outcomes with no time recording uh, at all. So not from a lawyer perspective and certainly not from a client perspective at all. Um, it's been a completely wild journey for two and a half years and uh, growing a team in three different cities. So I'm um, certainly looking forward to sharing that with everyone today. Thanks, Dimitri. So, uh, my name is David Bushby. I'm the managing director of Lexu. I've uh, been in startups since 2009. I've worked in or founded, launched startups, uh, four of them so far. So, you can sort of tell the lifespan of an average startup. I've had a couple of failures and then hopefully a success. Um, so, I've basically been in law for 15 years, and half of that has been practicing as a lawyer in private practice or in house, and then the other half has been in the startup space. So this is really, I guess, the niche and, and my passion. And uh, I 
I sort of manifest that in two ways. So I run Lexu by Bay, which is a legal services marketplace, quite similar to Lawpath, particularly in its origins in the UK, where I was uh, the chief operating officer. So very similar, quoting platform, about a thousand or so lawyers on the platform across the globe uh, to get fixed fee quotes. Um, from lawyers that are typically from larger law firms that have gone out solo, so they're low overheads and can price accordingly. Uh, since 2014, I've also been uh, creating a newsletter and pushing it out every week called Law Hackers Weekly, and that features four law tech startups from around the world every week. Uh, and so through that, I've featured over 700 startups in the legal space since that time, uh, and that's given me a bit of a view for what's been happening in the legal tech space since 2014. So I've seen some of those startups uh, go on to be quite well-known uh, startups with huge clients um, in the enterprise space. And I've also seen a, a number of startups fail and a number of founders go again on their second attempt. So it's been great to sort of be on that journey. Okay, I just wanted to ask the panel. I mean, you guys are, are in the thick of it. Um, you're several years into your journey or a few years into your journey. And just wanted to kick off with one question. If you were to start all over again, blank, blank slate from scratch, would you do anything differently? I suppose I'm holding the mic, so I better answer this one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really good question, and uh, I, I do think of this quite frequently. Uh, it's obviously hindsight is a wonderful thing. Uh, I think the global point which comes to mind is really get to know your market in a very, very close way. Uh, and I mean that in terms of the pain points of your, of your market, because you might think that the product that you're going to make or the service you're going to provide sounds great in, in your head, and maybe your wife or husband or your friends think, think it's great too, but they're always going to say that. Um, the, the reality is that you really have to get it out uh, to thought leaders who, 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 who don't know you or potential customers, and really understand the intimacy of their, of their pain points. Um, and I think that upon reflection uh, from the discussions that, that I've had with various founders uh, over, over the last three or four years is they have to, they have to um, iterate their product or they have to take a step back and maybe go in a different direction. And that's not necessarily because of a new piece of information that's come to light. It's because that information was available two or three years ago, but maybe they didn't go deep enough in, into their market to find out that, that point. So I think that would be the global yeah. uh, issue that and, I often... And by extension for you personally, does that mean, I guess, did you come to market with a solution that you thought would be the right solution without doing as much of that kind of customer discovery as you could have prior to actually committing to build something? Yes, uh, because the audio platform is something which is scalable, but that wasn't always the case. So Resolve Disputes <coughs> Online was um, initially going to be just for the larger side of the market, the, the larger courts and tribunals, which is, which is fine. But sometimes a large court or tribunal in Australia is very different to a large court or tribunal in Singapore or, or Canada. And similarly, you might have mediation centers who are down this end of the scale, and your technology has to be something that is scalable if you're providing just technology scalable towards that whole market that you're trying to produce because the amount of time that you'll spend trying to tweak your product to every single client that is not sustainable as a, as a, as a scalable tool so creating a, a, an MVP that is scalable that once it gets traction it can move very effortlessly in that market is a very critical thing to bear in mind whenever you're building a piece of technology yeah Claudia there are so many things that I would do differently. <laughs> um, the first one is that, I, I mentioned this to my, my team just before, um, I'm a sole founder, didn't start out that way, I founded my company with my dad and then he died. So I think having a founding team of at least two or maybe three founders is um, you know, a good idea and ideally one with lots of money. Um, <laughs> so that you know, if if it gets short, they can tip some in. Um, but so so that's definitely definitely important. So going to um, perhaps like you know how they have startup events and find a founder events and finding people with um, you know, skills, marketing skills, technical skills um, that you need for a startup is, is really important. Um, and the other thing, and, and you sort of touched on this, Joe, is 
is knowing more or better understanding how you're going to distribute your product before you build it. Um, we built ours and then we worked out how to distribute it and I, I don't think that that's the way around to go um, because once you change the way you distribute it then it requires uh, a lot more. It, it has to go back into development to, what to do change you mean by distribute? Do you that? So the way that you get your product to your customer, so the way that you, you market it, the way that you sell it. So initially, um, because my my first tech baby, Legal Beagle, was a, a B2C business, I thought that the way to sell <laughs> legal tech software was digital marketing. And I quickly realised that um, lawyers don't respond particularly well to digital marketing and they like to be um, introduced to you. Um, so it's a lot more getting warm introductions um, or just even picking up the phone, sending an email, that sort of thing. So so there's, so there's that. Because of that, it's meant that, um, yeah, we've had to rebuild part of the product to, to, to better suit that. Yeah. yeah. Great. Dom, anything keeping you up at night? Any late night regrets on how you might do things different? Uh, yeah, I'd echo a lot of um, Claudia's comments there. I think one of the big things is don't build custom too early. So um, we spent a lot of, if you think lawyers are expensive, developers are even more expensive. Yeah. And uh, so we spent a lot of money, millions of dollars, building custom software that we hadn't really scoped out properly. Um, and that might be from a technical perspective or through the right channel or even looking at the customer validation. So you know, what we do now, and it, you know, don't take this comment the wrong way because eventually you need your own proprietary software, um, but when you first start off, use as many third parties applications and pieces of software as possible. Plug them together with sticky tape and just get something working. Um, because yeah, Zapier is what well, all of our businesses are built on, I'm sure. Um, but just get something together from the beginning to end and get it into a customer's hands for as cheap as possible because what you'll find is that the way you thought they were going to use it is completely different to how they actually use it. And, and just to sort of um, riff off that, that, that sort of fits into that concept of the lean and style approach. Um, did you, did, do you guys follow that approach um, and can you just, for the audience that don't know too much about that, do you want to kind of express what that might be? Yeah, a lot of pressure, I'm not <laughs> sure I can remember it. Um, so I mean look, we, we, we did a little bit. I think um, um, you're, you're constantly having to, to go back and iterate and change things. Um, and so that's why if you've used something at the beginning that's almost like a plug and play, um, you can swap it out with something else or, or change it. Um, to give you a really, really practical example, um, we do automated company registrations. So um, we now have some proprietary software where we can link with ASIC and set companies up really quickly. Now that was about a half a million dollar bill. And so before we actually went ahead and did that, we used a third party system that could do it for us. And we learned how much clients wanted to pay, how they wanted to interact, how we could monetize them off the back of it. And once we knew that, then we knew we had the numbers behind us to go in and actually build it ourselves. And so I think you kind of look at, you know, we especially look at a lot of these big companies over in the US and think how, how great they are, but they weren't built in a day. They were built over 20 years. And so you can't be everything to everyone right at the beginning. You need to just build the small little thing for your one customer that you've chosen um, in one niche area, and then as a building block to the next customer and the next customer and the next customer. Yeah, I mean, you'd be amazed how many startups there are, not just legal startups, that have a very flashy website and a very flashy <coughs> video, but in the background, the whole thing's done manually with spreadsheets and phone calls and email, just to get back to that core concept um, around what the problem is that you're solving. And then once you commit to building product, it's not just the expense of building product and the, the developers that you need to hire, but that's an ongoing maintenance project. Tech breaks all the time. And I've never figured out exactly why, but it always does. So it's a commitment for the life of your company. Um, Dimitri, you want to shed some light on? Yeah, sure. I think the main thing for me is really I was naive about the response that I would receive from the industry, and then also the response that I would receive from trying to employ other lawyers. So um, for me, the biggest hurdle has always been attracting talent, and that is because law is such, 
such a risk adverse profession that it's been really hard to actually I spend more time pitching what it is that we do to other lawyers than I do to clients, um, which is ironic. Um, the fact that clients understand and believe in our model, but the fact that the profession is still struggles to get its head around what I think is a very simple law firm business model, um, but even more so to actually get lawyers to believe in the model to be part of it. That's definitely one thing that I underestimated um, the most. How would I change that from the beginning? I have no idea, but um, it's definitely one thing that takes up a lot of my time uh, in terms of doing that. Um, I suppose, yeah, Claudia and I touched on this point before around, you know, I'm a solo founder. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, some days it's a great thing because you can be in a meeting and make a decision and you can implement that very quickly. Um, but other days, you know, we're saying it's a, learn it's a lonely journey, you know? No one's giving you a high five at 3 a.m. when you're sitting in the office by yourself. Um, that's not what it's about. Um, yeah, no one ever. But would I change that? Uh, I'm still, I think, at that point where I'm really enjoying being part of that process and being able to have a really great team where we can just sit in a room and make a decision. Um, and so I think I'm definitely happy with that decision. But um, the biggest one is definitely the naivety, I think, uh, that the profession just, I think, still gives us more barriers than what it should. Um, I wanted to touch on something, we, we broadly talked about collaboration, uh, we broadly talked a little bit about uh, getting feedback, so there is this concept of startups that get built in stealth mode, so if you've ever sometimes attended a networking event and you meet someone and they say, I'm working on this style, and you go, oh, what is it, what it's about, how does it work, and they go, oh, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm sort of building this in private, we'll be ready in six months time and then release it to the market, so that's this concept of stealth mode, and some startups have absolutely successfully but did you guys ever take that approach of building in stealth in secret keeping your idea to yourself before launching it or did you take the more collaborative approach and get feedback from as many people as possible uh, and not thinking that they're just going to steal my idea and run with it I'm happy to start I didn't think anyone was going to steal my idea um, but I I also knew that there wasn't really anyone else in the market doing what we were doing at the time. Now there is a heat, which I'm really pleased to see. There's a lot more uh, lawyers now creating new law firms, which are completely different to a traditional law firm model. Um, but I was obviously in a very traditional law firm and you know, on that path and trajectory, um, but realized that I couldn't do set up a law firm as well as um, being a lawyer. So I actually resigned from my job and uh, spent quite, I spent about six weeks uh, overseas just solely focus on actually creating everything that I wanted to create and it wasn't until I came back um, and then launched the business, again, with sticky tape and had no intention of doing anything more than just seeing whether this was something that actually was going to be um, accepted. But I spoke to as many people as I could um, and then again quickly realised that speaking to anyone within the profession was a bad idea because um, they just dismissed it or didn't believe it was a viable thing uh, or didn't understand it. But certainly the more clients I spoke to, the more friends that I spoke to in the entrepreneurship and startup space, um, the more I realized that actually there was something there. Yeah, I think one of the sayings that always gets pulled out at, at startup events is that it's 10% idea and 90% execution. Um, and the reason that everyone says that is because it's 100% true. Um, so uh, the idea is fantastic, but keeping it secret and and holding on to it um, is going to go to Joe's point, which is you need people out there that, that are going to actually test your idea and buy your idea that isn't your mum and isn't your friends. And so it's really, really important to kind of get it out there. No, no one's going to steal your idea. Um, you know, we we do probably about sixty non-disclosure agreements a day at, at Lawpath, and um, the clients that come through, we often speak to them and they say, oh, I've, I've got a brand new idea and I need a non-disclosure <coughs> agreement to, to keep it from people. And um, we always turn around and say, you know, you're better to tell people about your idea to see what the response is um, because they're not, it's not in their interest to steal it. And the, and the other thing is investors as well. You know, eventually once you, you start up your business, um, you're going to need to go out and get some more, some, some money um, to keep growing. And... Um, those guys you're going to have to tell your idea and a lot of people will say oh I can't tell you my idea until you invest it's like you know, no one's going to give you money unless they know exactly what you're doing so um, get it out there no one's going to steal it I think the, the more feedback and the more collaboration you can have with people especially people um, from pot potentially in a more traditional industry like lawyers if lawyers respond well then you know you've got something good so I originally built my product for my 
firm. Um, so we did a lot of internal testing initially, and then once um, I sort of had a, a mindset shift and realised that this wasn't just a product for my firm, it was potentially you know a product for for other firms. Um, at that point, um, we had um, we created a beta group. We obviously needed to make quite a few changes to the product to put it in front of other people because it was very very rough when we were just using it as an internal tool. So we made some changes to it, we improved it, and then um, yeah, we had a, a better group of about 20 lawyers um, that we worked with over about three months. Um, and I've always been very open about what I was doing. Um, I've always you know, shared online a lot about you know, what I'm doing and, and how um, Sort of sharing the, the methods I'm trying and the results um, that I'm that I'm getting. So, while um, generally you know that's that's been good and we've been able to get really good um, testers on board and that sort of thing, which has led to really good customers of the the type that that we really like working with. Um, you know, when you are open about your ideas, there is you know there are some some downsides, but that come with it. Um, I'm not sure about you guys and whether you've copped much online abuse, um, but I've had everything from having a, an older lawyer say to my face, you're a silly girl with a silly website, <laughs> um, to, to, to being attacked about like my physical appearance. Like People are very um, you know, threatened mm. by, by what um, you know the likes of what we're all doing, and so there is there's definitely a downside yeah. to being really open about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had uh, again a lawyer say to us uh, in the UK, "I abhor what you're doing." Mm -hmm. It's just quite confronting to hear that. Um, but yeah, you will get that feedback. Uh, trying yeah. to disrupt an industry. I sent out um, an email to my email uh, to my mailing list last week, um, and I always start off an email, "Hey, name." And um, I got an email back from a 69-year-old uh, lawyer explaining why using the word hey to start off an email was absolutely unacceptable. It, it is amazing what you find. Like, I was doing some work in Perth and I had yeah, so-called experts and this only applies to the Eastern Seaboard and stuff like this. I mean, it's literally amazing what, what you hear. And you can feel as though, almost like you were the evangelist for the client experience, right? You know, kind of shouldering the whole thing on behalf of the of the legal profession, and and sometimes you know these are the attitudes that you get, and that's that's how you can end up kind of feeling. I think. Yeah. Joe, how about you? Did you keep the idea of an online dispute resolution platform to yourself in the initial days, thinking other people might run away with the idea, or did you openly share it and get that feedback? Yeah, very early days, uh, yes, because you've got to really have some some some. I guess some credibility as to what, what you're doing. It's no good talking about about ideas um, for, forever. Eventually, you, you have to do. So the approach that uh, that we took was 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 to do, uh, and then once we had a minimal viable product, that's when the pilots. You know, the, if you can get a, a revenue generating pilot, that's fantastic. We're very fortunate to have have those. And once you start building those relationships, not only does it give a bit of early revenue, if you can set up a pilot or get some, some users to test, uh, but it starts building that, that relationship. So I think there's a, there's a careful balance to be struck. You know, not being the person that just talk, talks the talk about legal technology, and believe you me, there's a lot of those. Um, but, but do. Do first. Find your place in the market. The legal services market, as we all know, is worth $500 billion. Um, it's a very big market, there's enough room for a lot of people. If your product's good uh, and you're good, there'll always be, be room for you. My advice would be not, not to worry about your product being, being copied uh, because there's, there's enough room. And if you are in a market that's so small that if your product was copied, you, you would die out, well, you're probably in, in the wrong market. So I, um, we had about four prototypes built of Autobio. Um, before I sort of met the right person at the right time, the right developer, um, and 
each of those prototypes was 50% funded by the New Zealand government. So in New Zealand you can get, um, if, you, if you're getting a prototype of a software built, they will fund 50% uh, up to about 20, 20 grand or something. So, so each of those uh, cost about 10 grand um, and all four of them were rubbish. Um, and then, like I said, it was all about meeting the right person at the right time at a Taranaki. So I'm from a small region in New Zealand called Taranaki. There's a group called Taranaki Technology. I met um, one, so my first team member, Matt, there, and um, then he built me uh, a prototype, and it was it was good. It was fine. He finally captured my vision for it. So, and then from there to to sort of get it to the next stage, we. Um, pretty much just took all the profit from our law firm and, and pushed it into that, yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, to my point before, you know, it's it's small steps, so to give you a really practical example, when we came up with the idea of the marketplace, I'm sure Dave went through exactly the same thing I'm about to explain. Um, we wanted to build this, this amazing automated system that could take briefs and cast them out to lawyers, and the lawyers would submit quotes and the payments would be done and it would all, all be kind of magical. Um, to start off, I bought a $19 landing page software um, where people would think they're putting in an automated brief. It would just come to my email. I would then use Microsoft Word to build out all the quotes, uh, which would take hours per client, um, and bundle it up in a zip file and make it look like it was all automated and send it back to them. Um, and if they ask questions, you know, send a <coughs> pretend automated email back to them saying the system will get back to you in 24 hours. Um, and it was all me on my phone. And so um, I think you have to concierge it at the beginning. And as Dave mentioned before, you are running around making it look like a, a robot's doing it when really it's you. Um, and then what happens is you start getting clients using it and you start thinking, well, actually, if I was to go and hire a developer part-time just to fix this first little bit or just to automate the email that goes back to them. Um, and then you get 20 clients and then you go, you know, it, it moves on. So. It's very daunting at the beginning to think I need to go and hire this big team of, of engineers to build this product, but really it's just small little steps um, and behind the scenes you are really faking it till you make it. Um, I suppose my journey is a little bit different in that I don't run a uh, technology startup, just run a law firm. And so um, I got a, a desk at a co-working space uh, and uh, got an email address that didn't have a website and just kind of sat there. Uh, and Went around, I mean, the way that I kind of started my journey was went around to every single co-working space in Melbourne and said, can I spend a day a week here and just be kind of like a call-in service and just have a desk here and happy to kind of answer any legal questions that any of your um, members might have. And I was like, oh, it's brilliant. And I was like, no charge, you know, happy to have a chat um, and just run some seminars and workshops and see what happens. And that's how I build a client base. Um, I had no team, I had no website, um, I had an email address um, and that was it. Uh, and so it really wasn't until we built a client base and then you know got a team and then finally you know our website was launched six months after it actually started. Um, but yeah, by that point we'd already had three lawyers join our team. So um, again, a bit of a different journey. But mine was just you know hit the streets and just kind of meet as many people as I could um, and offer as much value as I could before I asked for anything in return. Yeah, I think from. Um from our point of view, it was a slightly different journey, actually, uh, that we, as soon as we had a bit of traction uh, from some big players, uh, we went about then recruiting lots of uh, tech people, which, it, in retrospect, was uh, perhaps something which we could have done in a more staged way. Uh, we could have been a bit more, um, perhaps, uh, tactical about which people we brought in at various times, but we knew we had traction, and we needed to get something built really, really quickly. And the disadvantage that that brings, of course, is all of a sudden, you know, when your partner's saying to you, you know, can, can we go out for dinner tonight on a, on a Friday night, you're saying, no, I can't because I'm broke. Um, you know, so you, you're ploughing in a lot of your own savings. When everyone else is being really sensible and buying, you know, ha houses and various other things, you're just throwing money into a pit, uh, which is, you know, with, with, with the, the aim in due course to build a really good product. So. I think uh, you know everyone's experience is, is different, but I think the lean startup concept of 
getting a bit of traction, you know, as the guys are saying, you know, and building out a particular feature or a particular, you know, that addresses a particular pain point that you've noticed um, and getting those people involved at various junctures, that's probably a far more, should, should we say, cost-effective way uh, in, in the early days. But if you've got a very big uh, bank balance and you've, you've got a great idea, my advice is just as long as the, the, the product has traction or there's some response from, from the market, build, build that out. Um, but uh, of course, uh, in the early days when you want to take a, a lot of risk, um, it can be very, very daunting. Natalia Sinemarkovic, I'm with EY Law and I'm in a very unique position. I did practice as a technology lawyer for many years, but now I'm all about delivering new solutions to the market. But I'm in a very traditional, very large, but quickly evolving organisation, right? These guys and gal are doing amazing things from scratch. So the purpose of this session is to learn from them. They're amazing, they're doing amazing things and being, being acknowledged for their awesomeness in different areas. Um, and as Michael put it to me earlier, what we're hoping to do is share with you those things that um, if you knew earlier in the piece, would have made a difference. So, what, what did our panellists learn through the experience of setting up law startups, uh, which they wish they knew before they started or earlier in the piece? So before we go forward, can I have a show of hands? I, I had the privilege of meeting you briefly just then, but I don't think I got around to everyone. Who is looking to set up a legal or AI startup? Are you have an idea or you're just about to start? Hands up, please. One, two, three, okay, fantastic. Um, those of you who have a law startup or AI startup? A three here, <laughs> wonderful, okay, they're in the right place behind the, behind the, the tables here. And uh, the rest of you, I thought, you know, had enough of blockchain, right? So you've joined this, this session, yeah? Nah, okay, all right. Well, um, I'd like to firstly introduce our panelists. Um, Jean, unfortunately, couldn't be with us today. Um, we have Fiona and Tim Kirkman. They are a couple. Um, they have formed a business together called Law Switch. And Fiona is a family law mediator with a deep legal background and her compliment. Um, Tim is the technologist in the business. And they launched their, their, their firm, their, their company, Law Switch, their technology, back in February this year, and they're doing amazingly well. They recently won an award, um, and pursuant to that, they're, they're heading off to, in, to London in October to short, show Law Switch. Now, what does Law Switch do? Well, you may recall in our plenary this morning that um, uh, McCarthy, what's his first name? I haven't got my notes here. Marcus. Thank you. Marcus McCarthy was talking about the opportunities in helping engage or the pre-engagement process with our clients. Um, and that's precisely where Law Switch is playing, right? They're, they're, in, they're, they're improving that whole pre-engagement process through their automated chatbot. So I certainly look forward to learning a lot more about what Law Switch does in that area. So thank you very much for joining the panel. And we also have Michael Patterson. Michael was um, a, and still is, a technology lawyer with vast and deep experience. I had the privilege of working with Michael Oz in an in-house role many years ago, and he was at Allen's. Um, he was at Allen's for 20 plus years, um, has a depth of experience, knows the domain extremely well, and then decided to ditch it. And he set up his own law tech business. Um, and he has a, his business is called Contract Pro, and you'll learn a lot more about what he's doing, but very exciting things, he's using AI to review contracts. So his, his audience is very different to, um, the, the positioning is very different to that of Fiona and Tim. Um, Michael is looking at helping us lawyers do our job better, faster, quicker. So what I'll do, before we move on and ask our panelists to present, I'll just tell you a bit about the structure of, of this session. So our panellists will, will talk to you about their, their, their ideas, how they're executing on that, um, give you even a demo of what their solution involves. After that, we'll break into three huddles. Right, we're small groups, so there'll be like three or four people in each huddle. 
And the purpose of these huddles will be to explore um, the key issues that startups have in legal and AI. Okay, from these huddles, we'll take two or three points, uh, two I think, and we'll put them up in front of us so we can all then explore the issues that arose with particular insights from our panellists. And then we'll have question time. Does that sound good with everyone? Yes? Okay. Well then, I um, won't labour on about anything else, just hand straight over to our panellists. I'd like to invite Fiona and Tim to talk to us about the door switch. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming along to this session and thank you to the College of Law and Centre for Legal Innovation for having us today. Um, as Natalia said, um, we're Tim and Fiona Kirkman and we're a couple in law, myself and technology Tim. And today we'll share a little bit about our journey with Law Switch, um, some tips and traps, what we've learnt along the way. Um, we'll also give you a live demo of Law Switch and um, show you some of the artificial intelligence components of the product as well. So, Natalia. Thank you for, for the introductions. Um, just to expand on that a little, um, I've been practising as a lawyer for 15 years and I actually have my own family law mediation practice, Kirkman Family Law, and I do do some casual lecturing here at the College of Law. And so I really bring the legal foundation to Law Switch. Um, and la there was about this time last year, we started to have some conversations around the opportunities that exist in the market and how we could bring the law and technology together. Yeah, so I'm Tim Kirkman. Um, as introduced, I'm not a lawyer. My background is in technology and development software platforms. Um, my background really is uh, spans uh, e-commerce, e-learning, mobile apps, building things in the cloud, um, AI. And so my role in the Law Switch journey so far has really been uh, the developer and the architect and the builder. So I, I um, describe it as all the moving pieces, that's me, whereas all the brains, that's, um, that's what feet brings. So um, yeah, I, th I hope that today you'll find um, this session really um, interesting. Um, and I think you know, we'll just try and keep it quite informal as well um, in terms of what we both bring to the conversation around Law Switch. Yeah, so let's build a product. Um, I think this session is a really good one just to introduce what Law Switch is and why we decided to build a legal tech product. Um, you know, we would sit around the kitchen table over a glass of wine and have conversations around what it is like, uh, you know, day to day to run a law firm. You know, pick these brains around typically the client engagement process. Um, I mean, in family law, you know, specifically with Fiona. But you know, the conversation really was around uh, you know, the information that she needed to get from her clients, the documents that she needed to collect, the questions that she needed, um, the disclosure that she needed to um, be able to provide to the other side. And we realised that there was a lot of the conversation was repetitive. You know, it's the same kind of similar conversations, a different client, you know, different information will be collected, but the process and the structure was quite similar. And so we realised that because there was a lot of repetition, uh, repetition does open the door and opportunity for automation. And so by putting my developer hat on, we did see an opportunity to be able to start exploring, could we actually automate some of that client engagement process that you have when you're engaging with clients? Um, and we realised that, yes, you know, this is something that through that process we could definitely do. Um, and so out of that law switch, uh, was born. It was uh, we saw the opportunity to be able to bring that um, as a platform um, and deliver through your websites. And we really saw that it, it was a, an industry that's ripe for disruption, ready to get into the 21st century, 18 years on, and that we could bring together that law and technology knowledge um, to collaborate and, and build a product, um, Law Switch. So I guess the, the main problem we identified. Um, in my practice was, is this the, the client engagement process that um, your firm is, is going through generally? Um, from my 15 years of legal experience, I um, often found that it was very time consuming, um, quite a complicated and manual process of engaging with clients um, with many phone calls and emails. 
and that this process is something that could be automated and um, a better client engagement process could be had by clients. So Law Switch, um, really the, the sale point is um, a, a better client engagement process. Um, the Law Switch aims to upgrade your, your website from merely being an online brochure to an automated booking and intake platform that saves you time and money. So it has legal chatbots and anyone who went to the session earlier today, um, we'll, we will briefly discuss legal chatbots, but the Law Switch utilises legal chatbots to engage with clients and the legal chatbots are embedded on your website. We also have online um, calendar bookings which integrate with your calendar. Um, document automation and email automation. So the work of Law Switch isn't aimed at replacing lawyers and I think a lot of people get scared about legal tech replacing lawyers um, but really to support and complement what a lawyer does in their everyday work so that we can as lawyers focus on giving value to our clients and providing that strategic legal advice, empathy etc. So chatbots are conversational. Um, you attended the session possibly this morning where you know you explored what chatbots look like. And I guess from a product point of view, when we were looking at the client engagement process, um, how we came about the decision to use chatbots as that primary experience and that engagement with your prospective clients. Um, it really came down to understanding you know, how you engage with your clients. And a lot of it is conversational based. It's all about the conversations and the questions that you ask. It's following up. Whether it's on the phone or in an email, it's driven by conversations. Um, and doing some research, we identified that um, the primary way of capturing information today typically is forms. We found forms don't really replicate um, the kind of way that you capture information, the way that you work through that engagement process with your clients. Um, you know, they're quite structured and rigid. Uh, they can be quite sterile and kind of lack that engagement quite often. Whereas chatbots are designed around conversations. And so that's why we decided to, uh, from a product point of view, to build on the, on the platform of a chatbot experience. And they're also designed around modern engagement as well. You know, they are designed to be short, sharp conversations. Um, everyone's quite time poor these days. So, um, you know, they do flow quite quickly as compared to, you know, kind of working through a, a form which can take a lot of time. So what we aim to do is build a product that is completely automated end-to-end, -end, as Fiona did um, introduce in the opening slide. Uh, Law Switch does do a lot more than just provide chatbots, and that's because your engagement um, experience needs to do a lot more than just have conversations. So we have built in an AI engine in there to be able to, using natural language processing, to be able to answer questions that people might have, so they can ask that through the chatbot, and then your chatbot will then be able to find the most appropriate response from a knowledge base that you can manage and can respond back in, in, um, in kind with the most appropriate response. And so this is really identified um, to help you answer those frequently asked questions and those inquiries that can get through to your law firm. It can then do a little bit of a triage as well, so using that AI, if it responds with a particular response from that knowledge base, it can then dive into a more detailed conversation through um, the chatbot conversation and ask more fine-tuned questions if it determines for instance, that their inquiry is related to, let's say, you know, their wills, uh, wills and estates matter, or their, um, you know, their family law matter, but they're, you know, related to their children. Uh, it also has a document automation engine. Uh, you know, quite often you might need to generate letters, uh, flyers, brochures, um, you know, some recommendations, and you want to document that, and quite often you want to send that to your client. So Law Switch also does that as part of the engagement process. And also sends emails and allows people to then um, reply back with documents through a secure client portal. So it's a whole lot more than just chatbots and the intention is to really help you to replicate all of those touch points that you will have with people as part of your client engagement process. So what have we learned? Many things. Um, get your hands dirty um, and get into the legal tech. And I guess there's never enough time there's never enough money, um, but you have to make a start. Um, I have learnt myself um, to focus a bit more. Um, I tend to do a lot, um, but really it's the importance of playing to your strengths 
and working out what is a good opportunity versus what is a distraction from your goals in the legal tech startup. Um, we have um, learned the importance of product market um, and understanding your target market and the, that marketing sales process, that it's quite unique to law firms, that marketing and sales process. And there's the old way of innovating and the new way of, of innovating. And I guess there's a bit of a divide now on the old law and new law. Um, and to understand that and understand lawyers' mindsets and how to bring about change in organisations. And the importance of great client or customer service um, when providing um, a product such as LawSwitch. So it's really balancing and balancing that we're selling a product um, versus offering professional services and the level of customisation um, that we offer as well. So we've learnt a lot um, and we're keen to share in the, the session today in groups. Um, and pe please feel free to come and discuss with us um, what we've learned if you're looking to start your own legal tech startup as well. So I'll briefly give a, a short demo of Law Switch in action. The technology works, which is... <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's make sure it all works. Life demos are, are always interesting beasts. We'll see how we go today. So what we've put together here is just a really um, simple showcase for you to get a good understanding of how Law Switch works and what it looks like and how, how it can help you from a law firm's point of view. So this is a sample of our law firms. It's a sample law firm's website. It's, it's probably got a lot of the different um, and uh, information that you probably have on yours. And what we've got is about half a dozen different legal bots running throughout this site. Um, many of them will engage with me as I interact with the site. Now obviously, you know, this is jam-packed so that I can demonstrate it, but it hopefully will show you the way that, um, you know, you can start using legal bots. The first way is, of course, having it floating down the bottom right-hand corner of the screen there, as you can see, so when I click on that, launch it. That's a great way of asking people to engage. It's kind of just there, you know, if people do kind of get a bit stuck and want to ask questions. But you can also connect them up to buttons uh, and links. So, for instance, there's a, um, a chat bot that will start a conversation if I click the Let's Get Started button. Um, there's another legal bot here which will take you through uh, a conversation to generate an NDA document um, all online, a privacy statement. And you can also use them behind conversations such as if you've got content on your website that you would like um, to distribute to people but you'd like to get a bit of information from them first, you can also use a bot to handle those short sharp conversations. You can also use uh, legal bots as well as part of the appointment functionality um, in Law Switch uh, to book appointments. Uh, and so you can provide different conversations for every single one of your lawyers uh, and your professionals within your firm to have their own conversations and then allow people to book time with them through um, a legal bot. So what do they look like? Let's just launch one now. So this one here is, I call it the receptionist chatbot um, because it can handle uh, frequently asked questions. Um, it can also, uh, through the I have a question button here, it can also book appointments um, with your firm uh, and it will also handle general inquiries. So it's designed to, I guess, effectively replace a bunch of forms you probably already got on your site while also bringing a few smarts in using the AI engine um, and also the booking functionality. So if I say oh, I have a question, it'll say, um, you know, I can answer a few general questions and if I can't help, I'll pass through inquiries to someone who can. So I could ask, um, should I ask where are you? Uh, and what it will do is it will go and match the most applicable response and come back to so we're located in Sydney, New South Wales, and our business hours are nine to five Monday to Friday. And our office phone number is this. Is this helpful? And I might say yes because it answers my question, or I might say no, I've got another inquiry. Actually, um, do you do fixed fee pricing? It might be something that's important to me. Um, and it'll say, you know, we practice in the areas of X, Y, and Z. You'll notice that this is a template. So the intention here is that all of this is customizable. You don't, you know, you're not stuck with the conversation that you see here in the presentation. You've got full control over the flow of the conversation. So we, you know, we uh, provide uh, upfront fixed fee pricing and believe in providing top class level services every time. So I might say, yes, I have one more query. That sounds good. Let's book an appointment. 
and now it'll say I can assist with booking initial consultations, would you like to book online now? And so the person still has the opportunity to say, no, please just call me later and it will ca capture contact details and pass them through in an email. But I could say, let's book it now and it's gonna give me all of the availabilities um, that's connected up to this calendar. Now if you use a cloud calendar like um, Google, the Google Suite, uh, Office 365 or Outlook, it will automatically find the availabilities in their calendar in and around the meetings that you've already got booked and then propose them back. So I could um, you know, select uh, four o'clock on Monday, sounds good, and return back to the conversation. So you can see that it can start to do things like providing ability for people to book time. It can do lookups and a whole bunch of other things as part of this flowing conversation. Could I get your name, which I will answer quickly now. Uh, nice, what is your appointment related to? And I might say it's related to my business. Is there any details that will assist with your appointment? And I could take some time here to you know, type in a bunch of information, but um, I'll just keep it simple. And could I also get your email address? So I'll put that in as well. I'll type in correctly. There we are. Uh, what is your best contact number? And that's the end of the conversation. So what it would typically do now is um, send two emails, uh, one to the person who just had the conversation with me, um, and that would be um, completely template driven, so you can put in your own words and language and information on your firm and the areas of law, um, and one to somebody within your law firm who will then handle the inquiry. I might just spend a little bit of time to show you, um, you know, what it's like from uh, an administrative point of view to actually manage uh, a legal bot. Now you've seen one in action there, but what does it actually look like to build and manage one um, from a law switch point of view? So if you log into law switch, you will get uh, access to a conversation designer. So we've designed this um, after a bit of research to reflect a conversation. So we built it around the concept of a narrative. So what the chatbot will do is it will start at this very uh, top point here, you know, welcome to the firm, please take a moment to answer our questions, and it will work its way all the way down to the very bottom till it's the save and finish point, which will indicate that the conversation is finished, it, it's run the course, um, and it should submit all the information through to the next step of that automation process, sending those emails and generating those documents. But it's quite easy to use. I mean, you can just drag and drop to change um, the order of things. You can click in something here and make changes to um, any of the text that will be said. You can put in other things like uh, you know, decision trees um, and logic to be able to customise the flow of the conversation based on the information that the chatbot is collecting. But, and you can also obviously connect it up to the appointment scheduler, which I've shown you. But it does have the AI engine behind it, and if I go to the knowledge base here, um, this is where you can start to build up that library of responses, so the kind of ways that you would like to respond to those open-ended questions that people have at the beginning. Um, and uh, what it will do is it will uh, try and match um, so what someone types in, it'll try and understand what their topic and intent of the question is, and then try and match it to the most applicable response. You can also provide some more things like advanced training around sample questions and things like that. So you can provide a training set um, for the engines who also use to further refine it, and so that it can learn what the most appropriate response is to the most, you know, to the kind of ways that people might ask questions. And finally, as well, you can also put in alternative words uh, to be able to address that broad spectrum of language um, that people will use to ask the same question but in a multitude of different ways. So it'll intelligently uh, switch out those words in all of the content of those responses that you've built into your knowledge base automatically. So hopefully that goes to show in a really quick way uh, what we built in LawSwitch, uh, what a legal bot looks like, how it can work on your website, um, and the, the, the back end, how you can actually build a legal bot and get started. So the intention with LawSwitch is for it to be a self-service product, we, we do intend for uh, you know, customers to be able to jump in here and build their own bots um, and their own um, client engagement processes. So we do have some assistants that are already templates that you can use in various different areas of law, family law, criminal law, um, conveyancing, etc. And But then as Tim said, they can be completely customised and branded for your area of law. Um, and to, to meet the language that your, your law firm uses. Um, so it is self-service. Um, we do 
it, we can assist customers if that's what you need, um, but it is designed to be a, a self-service, low-risk, low-cost um, product. And as Natalia said, we, we're, we're blessed to win the Legal Geek um, Road Trip World Tour um, off to London, so expanding um, internationally, which is, it was, which is exciting, um, and Law Switch is um, available on a free 14-day trial. Um, there's some videos online as well, and we'd love to chat with you further about starting a legal tech um, startup business um, or, or the Law Switch. So please do come and chat with us. And it would be great um, having seen Law Switch and a bit of the AI and, and the way the product works. If you've got any questions when we do break out um, around how it works or if there's things that you've seen that you might be thinking about how to implement this kind of technology in your own law firm or in your own startup or product that you're thinking. Um, you know, it'd be a great opportunity to you know, have a chat and um, you know, talk through um, our experiences in building Law Switch. I worked at Allen's for um, over 20 years. I won't say the exact number. Um, and all that time I really had a passion for the technology and so I did a part-time computer science degree while I was working at Allen's and always kept an eye on what was happening with the technology and eventually one day the passion for the technology overrode the passion for the law because that's why I ended up doing what I am now doing. That is not to say I didn't enjoy being a lawyer, I loved being a lawyer. Uh, I enjoyed um, mixing with intelligent people, solving problems, dealing with clients. I thought that was all good stuff. There was a part of being a lawyer that I didn't enjoy. That was the drudgery, or well, use it word advisedly, of reviewing agreements and draft agreements. I found that was a task that was uh, tedious, prone to errors, and clients, I found, were not really prepared to pay $800 an hour to have a partner law for to go through and check that the definitions in the agreement all made sense and were all there and that type of thing. So I thought there had to be a better way to do what I was doing and I thought that no one else was doing it, so I would. So what I'm going to do is start with an example, show you what the product is and then talk a little bit more about my um, journey. So it's another live demo. Okay, so this is the website and this is mistake number one. This is all about lessons. I'm going to try and share a few of my mistakes with you. Mistake number one, what does almost every startup do when they decide to form a startup? They go out and pay a lot of money to get a really swish website design. Do not do that. You can, what you need to do first is to develop what they call, if you're interested in starting a startup, you will have heard the term MVP, minimum viable product. Okay, what you need to do is you need to develop a minimum viable product which is a sufficient presence to determine is there in fact a market out there for what you want to do. This sounds really basic, but um, uh, you can get an MVP, you can get a, a website that will test the market. You can just use a standard WordPress, you'll be able to do that, pop a website for free and put it up and determine. One of the best MVPs I've heard of was someone who was trying to determine whether there was a market online advice in a particular area of law. They put a WordPress website up, cost them about $50 to get up there, put it available, and asked a few questions. And when the person then responded with those questions, they said, fine, thank you for your interest in our product. We'll get back to you when we're ready. And that was that. And they did that to test whether the market was there. Over the space of a week, they had several thousand inquiries. And they said, there's a market there. It is now worthwhile going out and uh, spending a lot of money in actually developing the product. But it's so simple. So people ask, what is an MVP? An MVP is something as simple as possible to determine whether there is in fact a market there because your view as to what the market is might be quite different um, to what the market in fact is. So this is not the website that I paid a lot of money to a website firm in Richmond, uh, Melbourne, um, to design because that I had a preconceived view as to what the market was going to be. And so the first thing I did was went to the website designer and said, okay, I'm developing a technology to do this can you please design a website for me? And they designed a website that was um, generally okay, but just was not at all suited for what the market ended up being. So that's lesson number one. I spent a lot of money on a website that really never actually saw the light of day. I then paid for this website to be developed. So what it does, and what Contract Pro does, is an automatic review of legal agreements, taking away that drudgery that I was referring to before that forms part of a commercial lawyer's life 
of working out are the terms designed, defined, and need to be defined, are the, all the clauses in the contract that need to be in that type of contract. So how it works, I'm going to give you a demo here now. So I shall upload, um, a shareholder. Now, this is a list of the types of agreements that are currently reviews, and you can't see it because I can't scroll down the code, but anyway. One of the, it effectively reviews six types of agreements at present, shareholders agreements, non-disclosure agreements, technology licences, employment contracts, independent contractors, and um, supply agreements. Okay, so you choose what type of agreement you have presented it with. Now you'll notice that the shareholders agreement are just reviewed as a general concept of a shareholders agreement. All the other types of agreements, you choose what perspective you want it to be reviewed for. And so with the non-disclosure agreements, you choose, am I acting for the recipient, am I acting for the discloser, or is it meant to be a mutual NDA? And that's really important because as a practicing lawyer myself, I was never after the perfect NDA. That was never my aim. I just wanted the perfect NDA for my client on that day. That was the, my aim. And so this is very much an unashamedly one-sided view of a review. So you select the agreement. And you enter your subscription code because you pay for a subscription, and then you press get report. The AFCAL shareholders agreement, just to put this into context, is a uh, shareholders agreement template prepared by the Australian Venture Capital Association Limited. It's a Sydney based organisation where all whose members are all private equity firms in Australia, used in probably a couple of hundred deals for private equity investments throughout Australia. So this is pretty close to a quote, market standard type document. It's about a 60 page document, and you can see that it's reviewed by the tool within about 30 seconds. So this is what you get when you run it through the tool. You start off, you get a score. Zero out of 10, it's pretty depressing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not hard to get zero out of 10. You do occasionally see seven, eight, nine, or even 10, occasionally 10 out of 10. But I'll tell you, um, that score is a function of the number of problems that have been identified in this particular type of contract out of 10. To give you a quantitative measure of how good the contract is to being close to the mark, I have some customers that use that score to do perform a triage. If the score is above 7, it doesn't need to go to legal. If it's below 7, it goes to legal for review. So that allows the company to empower commercial managers and the like um, to determine whether or not they need to send something to legal or not. You then get a plain English summary of the agreement, telling you what the agreement does. So this is what the agreement does, or come to what the agreement doesn't do in a moment. Uh, that's a plain English summary of all the key issues covered by the agreement. And some of my customers actually use that and can send that to their client, because it's actually quite a good summary of where things are covered, uh, what things are covered and where they're covered. And if it's something that surprises you, you've got the reference point here, to be able to say, okay, it's in clause such and such, so I can quickly go to that clause and have a look at how that's covered. One of the things this will pick up is if there are in indemnities in the agreement. We all know how important indemnities are to lawyers. It will tell you every indemnity that is in the agreement, so that if you're interested in knowing the terms of the indemnities, because they are the sorts of things that really determine, uh, depend on fine changes of wording, um, you look at that yourself. You don't need to scour through the agreement for that. You'll be told exactly where the indemnities are. Okay, you've had the summary, you now have the problems. And it tells you I found 29 problems, that's why we've got a score of zero out of 10, because there are 29 problems there. A few cross-reference errors, they're actually not <coughs> that serious in this particular agreement, but sometimes they're very serious. Um, one undefined term, and I'll come to that in a moment, because that's a huge problem. And 14 clauses that are missing that you might like to consider for inclusion. So I'll just give you one example of the 14 clauses. Now, if any of you have had involvement with shareholders agreement, a key part of the shareholders agreement is what they call the reserved matters. They're the matters that cannot be done by the company without agreement of 75, 80, 90 percent of the shareholders. So they're really important if you're a minority shareholder, you want to have a long list of reserved matters because that's your ability to control and stop the company running amok um, contrary to your wishes. One of the reserved matters is, is often 
whether the company can embark on litigation or not. Because I spent most of my time as a commercial lawyer trying to keep my clients away from the courtroom. It's risky and expensive. So one of the things that uh, is often in that list is before embarking on litigation, you need to have a certain percentage of shareholders agree to doing that. There is no, in the AVCAL standard, no requirement for <coughs> litigation to be approved by a specified majority of shareholders. And I've tried to, when I was starting law, I spent a lot of time being beaten up around Melbourne by senior partners of law firms who, when I put forward a position, they said, well, that's not market practice, Michael, and just refusing to engage with me because I was a junior lawyer that didn't deserve to be engaged with them. I thought, gee, I would love to have a Bible of market practice to be able to go back to that senior partner and to say, you know, actually it is, it's in this Bible. A lot of, a lot of negotiations seem to me to be more driven by you know, hairy chested fet, uh, fist pumping rather than actually um, any attempt at logic or what is in fact market practice. And so I would like to lead a practice in Australia of developing a bit more data driven negotiation. And so part of this is to tell you how often shareholders agreements contain this is a reserved map. 24% of them do. Now, you might take the view, well, that's only about a quarter. I'm not particularly far. But others, issues that we've got here, occur in 54% of agreements. So we're getting closer to a market practice here. And so you've got some data now to go back and have your negotiation and say, no, we'd like it to be included. If nothing else, it allows you to make an informed decision. You can say, OK, institution of litigation, could care less about that, I don't really care, but at least you do so knowing that nearly a quarter of the shareholders' agreements have got that as a clause. And so you actually turn your mind to the issue before you um, decide whether to include it or not to include it. And a number of other issues that I won't, I won't take you through, but the, probably the most serious problem is the lack of a definition of the term fair market. And this is used in the context of the um, provisions in the agreement that determine how much is someone is going to be paid when they're being bought out against their will. So typically if one shareholder has breached the agreement, there is a, a mechanism for the other shareholders to buy them out at the fair market price for their shares. And so you need to know what the fair market price is. There is a process in our agreement for determining the fair market price but there's actually no definition of what the fair market price is meant to be. And that's a really important thing, because you're still in the situation here where people are inherently going to be at loggerheads. You can't rely on goodwill or reasonableness or anything. Someone's been bought out against their wishes. They're going to be concerned about this. And so you'd like to get the complete objectivity when you determine what the fair market price is. What is it now? A definition that I've seen in Shell for is something like the fair market price is the price that a willing but not anxious buyer would pay for, to a willing but not anxious seller. Something like that, so you've got some objective measure. Or maybe the fair market price is the price that equivalent shares have sold for in the last 12 months. And maybe there's all other sorts of definitions for what a fair market price would be. This agreement doesn't contain that. And that's why you get marked quite heavily on the score by having definitions like that that aren't in fact included in the, the agreement. Going down a bit more tells you a few other things. The errors are categorised into critical, serious, and less serious. So the NACM is the less serious category. It tells you the agreement can't be assigned. Shareholders' agreements, you typically wouldn't want them to be assigned in the event. So that's really just for way of information. But at least you can turn your mind to it. If you are of the mindset of lawyers, and I have had clients who are, who think that when you define a term, you must be absolutely punctilious throughout the agreement, always using that term in capital letters, this will tell you where you've got to find terms that have been used in lowercase, exactly where you've used them in lowercase. I had one client who insisted <coughs> that wherever the word notice or notify occurred in agreement, it had to be with a capital N to indicate that that was notice as per the definition of the notice clause in the agreement. And um, I, when I developed this section of the tool, I thought, gee, that client would love this. Just being able to have, to have all those um, instances where notify was not used with an N spilled out. So, other or less so, I, I told you a couple of my mistakes with respect to the um, design of the website and wasting money on that. I suppose that stems from a more fundamental problem of not having done enough market research first. Um, I thought that because I, as a partner of the law firm, found 
um, this a challenging problem that other people would as well. And I have to say that I think many lawyers are still pretty happy doing the job in their standard traditional way. Even though I can demonstrate to them that that's not going to be 100% accurate, they still are more comfortable doing it that way. I think that comes back to uh, an overall lesson. If any of your startups are paying to sell to lawyers, particularly lawyers who work in external firms, think very carefully about keeping your day job. You do. They are a very hard market to sell to. And I, I think the reason is that they are inherently trained to be very, very critical. And um, that's part of their DNA. So you can give um, a lawyer uh, a, a document with 20 good points and one mistake, they will just zoom in on that one mistake and throw the whole document out. And um, uh, there is another trait of lawyers that they will hold the artificial intelligence, and it's not, probably not just lawyers, but it's probably more general, they will hold the artificial intelligence to a higher standard of accountability than they will hold a human to. And so the example I, I often give here is that if an autonomous car has an accident, it's front page news around the world. People have accidents every day, it's not front page news, but people hold AI to a higher standard of accountability in general. Lawyers in particular hold this type of AI to a very high standard of accountability. So if there are any mistakes at all in the report that's produced, the lawyer tends to throw the baby out with the um, that with the bathwater. So if that is your target market, thinks very seriously about the DNA of the people that you're going to be selling to and how hard that is going to be. Turning a product into a business. And um, I think it is somewhat of a lack of, lack of the draw on a lot of legal tech startups do fail. It's really getting that traction and um, that interest in the product and then um, investing in that marketing and sales funnel and that channel to market that shark that Michael referred to there. Um, avoiding that shark. Avoiding the shark. <laughs> avoiding the shark. So, so I, I think it's, it, it is difficult balance though. Yeah, I think ideally you should not have the product until you work out where the market is. Mm. Okay, so if you've, if you've adopted the, 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 the modern thinking about you know, lean business and so on, you'll have your MVP first and work out where your market is. The people that did what I talked about, where they had their WordPress site and people that left their details with them, when they then had the product, so you know, cart before the horse, when they had their product, they then had a couple of thousand of email addresses saying thanks for your interest and went out live. Um, so ideally you should be able to know where your market is by the time you've got your product. There are so many startups are solutions looking for a problem and they're the ones that fail. I'll probably just say as well, taking that one step further, is you can identify your market, you know, how big it is, you know, where they are, you know, who they are, but also do some research on how they want to engage with you as well. I think that's something that you can tick those boxes and say, yep, there's an opportunity, um, you know, there's a need for a product, there's a market, it's big enough, it'll sustain the company that I'm looking at, um, tick, 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 but then you really need to understand how they actually want to engage with you. You know, uh, are they expecting a completely self-service experience where they don't interact with you, or are they looking um, for you to guide them the whole step of the way? Is it a little bit of both? Um, you know, how you know, is, is it customizable? Is it a black box? All of these kind of things is the, the expectations around how to actually engage with your audience um, is really critical. I think we've, I mean, we've learned lots of lessons, you know, around that. Um, and, you know, just understanding how to actually then work with your your audience. Thank you, everyone, for your participation and also for presenting and sharing the wisdom, your trials and tribulations in setting up your own legal startups. My three key takeaways. Uh, contract Pro, do not start with your website. <laughs> Have a minimum viable product first. Test it on the market. Test your fundamental assumptions because they may not be right and you may need to pivot. Fiona and Tim, brilliant. You've um, rolled up your sleeves and you've constantly engaged with your clients. And that is huge. That is so important to, to work with your clients, to define actually who your clients, what are you going to be delivering for whom, and keep on reiterating that. And then when you get started, there are so many opportunities to partner. You should take every opportunity to work in you know, the new innovation model that Fiona spoke about. 
it's, it's working collaboratively with people, not thinking that it was my idea, I'm going to be costed working on it, working on it. Um, because as Michael said, you know, it could be a solution waiting for a problem to fix, and you don't want to be there. So I'm um, in the partnership and the, you know, the, the accelerator piece, as Michael said, um, do your due diligence um, to make sure you're not dancing with a shark. Um, but that's a very negative um, ending to this session. Um, I congratulate you all because we've had some really, really good conversations in, in our little huddles. So thank you, everyone, and thank you very much, panellists.